All right. Look, Judy, hello, up hello first. <laughs> Southern Tier, Corning, New York. Hi, Constance. We have a lot of Canadian tri cars down here in Florida at the moment. <laughs> Ontario cars. <laughs> <laughs> Right, it's a, feel right at home in Canada down here. Madison is a lovely city. The, uh, yeah, uh, so the, I think the, uh, it's going to be, uh, we're going to have fun today, but don't worry, someone was sad as ending. Y'all have sent in so many questions, we're going to do a, a whole post-Christmas uh, Q&A. Yeah. Uh, with Dom, and, and those questions we don't oh, get to. Hello from New Zealand. And I wonder what time is it there? Um, oh, I don't know if it's yesterday or tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I remember flying back from New Zealand and it was a long trip. Yeah. I I feel like once the plane flight gets over six hours, then... Yeah. When, it's, once you land before you leave, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it okay so it is currently 8 a.m tomorrow well it's, so she's a, she's a day closer to okay. uh to christmas that's what my kids would be that's primarily right. focused on you like so yes, we will do extra q a <laughs> but apologies for not getting to them beforehand <laughs> yeah well we're very excited to have you all here i'm gonna hit the record button and then we can uh Excellent. Oh, hey, Julie. Julie's in Winston-Salem. It is cold today. It was it's 25 cold. when I woke up in North Carolina today. I'm right down the road. It's uh, 50s and 60s in mid in the central Florida. Ah, uh, well, I know. Oh, it's very rare that I, when I open up the weather app and it shows me all the places I've lived, that um, I say to myself, wow, it's warmer in Edinburgh today. It's that crazy. was That was what I thought today <laughs> when it's cold in edinburgh or ireland it's cold it's damp cold oh yeah it goes through you i've never bought so many jackets as it doesn't uh, make any difference it starts inside and comes out like the, the cold comes comes that way in ireland and northern england yeah well with, with for God. yes oh wolfgang it, it is cold it's good to see you um well thank uh, Christ the King Lutheran and Carrie, wonderful congregation. Um, anyway, so thank you all uh, for joining us. This is the last of the main four visual uh, sessions, but um, y'all have sent in some amazing uh, questions, and I've been uh, I've been organizing them and saving them. So we are going to do a follow up Q and A with Dom after Christmas. You'll all get the email invitations. Don't worry. But after this, if you have more questions, as you either catch up or talk to your friends and such about it, um, feel free to go ahead and send any more questions. These could be more broad because it won't be specifically, you know, on uh, just the uh, visual lectures themselves. Uh, in addition to that, tomorrow, Dom and I's friend, Diana Butler Bass, is joining for a live stream. Any of you are more than welcome uh, to join. Uh, that'll be a, a uh, uh, she and I do regular live streams for our like the members of the homebrewed community and her um newsletter and this one is the readers can ask us anything dom and they went they got creative these questions completely unrelated to christmas and visual lectures some of them rather entertaining um people should feel free to ask me anything because i feel free to lie if i want Well, one of my favorites people sent was. I just lie. <laughs> my favorite one uh, I got sent for tomorrow. Someone said, "I want to know the most creative way you and Diana have been called a heretic in an email." And I was like, "Whoa, there's some stiff competition. Stiff mm. competition." <laughs> but uh, luckily, Dom has never been called one, so he would just spend all this. He would have to lie to come up with a uh, email he's ever received uh, identifying his heretical status. But um, yeah, so that's coming up after Christmas. You'll get an email with the date. 
for the Q and A, um, and uh, in the email that I sent out uh, this morning, it also has a link to the upcoming class Homebrew's doing in January with eleven different scholars, scientists, philosophers, theologians, looking at how we understand encountering the divine um, using different disciplines, helping people process, think through um, that challenge uh, after the easy answers of narrow religion. So, um, yeah. So here we go. This is the fourth video lecture, um, visual, visually stimulating. And uh, I'll let you take it away, Don. All right. So we already know what's going on with this one. By the way, we should have a competition for what those two individuals are saying. I, my suggestion is that one of them is saying, I told you to bring the Jeep. All right, going to the next one. All right, so for the fourth class, again, my expression, parabolic overtures, this concerns the virginal conception and the Bethlehem birth. And you can see the two characters that I have on either side of Jesus. One is um, Augustus, of course, and I'm showing him here as a high priest. He's the Pontifex Maximus. That's the supreme bridge builder, Pons and Fatchere, who, who builds a bridge between earth and heaven, which is quite a claim for him, of course. It's also, by the way, the title of the, the, uh, the Pope in Rome. So somebody has a sense of humor somewhere. And then on the other side is David. And we usually see David full frontal. But I want him I want you to see David this way. What he's doing is citing <laughs> Goliath uh, on his shoulder in his left hand is the sling. The stone is presumably in his right hand and he's citing him. He's so that, that's an angle of David that raises the issue of violence and things like that that we'll get to in, in today. So moving then to the next one. The images you might recognize are from Ghiberti's um, The Door, the uh, what would it be, the North Door of the Basilica, the um, Baptistery of the Cathedral in Florence. So I'll be using some of these that we saw before. So the first part today is both infancies, the infancy of Matthew and the infancy of Luke, the stories. They agree on Jesus's virginal divine conception. They both say it. I've given you the text there to left from Matthew. Mary's engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, which is a discreet way of saying she was a virgin, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Then again, the child conceived us from the Holy Spirit. By the way, notice that they never say from God. <clears throat> it's from the Holy Spirit of God which is identifies it as we saw with the Holy Spirit as the spirit of liberation and distributive justice. Then you also have it from Luke, of course, the angel Gabriel sent by God, virgin engaged to Joseph. You will conceive, I am a virgin, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So both of them agree on this. And as you remember, this does not come from Isaiah 7, 14. This comes from the tradition before them and we have to ask why the tradition, what it intended by it. Remember that Matthew's five prophetic fulfillments, he's kind of desperately searching to come up with five and he's getting diminishing returns. So that comes later. The idea of a virginal conception born of the Holy Spirit, conceived of the Holy Spirit rather, is there before anyone thought about 714 of Isaiah. And then the next one. So here's what's at issue, reading down from the bottom. In antiquity, a transcendentally successful adult, somebody who, according to their culture, had pulled off something magnificent. For example, Augustus, after 20 years of savage civil war with hardened legions on both sides, he had achieved peace. His title was Princeps, which I translate as first among equal, with all the equals dead, but <laughs> he had established peace. So, transcendentally successful adult. Retroactively then, retroactively, you give him a transcendental prophetic infancy. You don't want to be, just say, well, it just happened to be born. 
happen to be conceived. He gets a transcendental prophetic infancy and as a predestined child, the child is also given a marvelous conception somehow and a marvelous birth somehow and also a marvelous coming of age. And if we feel, well, we wouldn't do it that way, out of courtesy, we give them their way of saying it. We might give the person, if somebody today came up with a successful vaccine that eliminated all of cancer, and if everyone was willing to take it, then we might say the person was a genius, Nobel Prize or something. In the ancient world, they would say that person has manifested divine power, is an image and revelation of the divine, and they would call him a daughter of God or a child or a son of God or God. That's the way they did it. So what we're always asking then is, do we agree with that? Like you and I might say today, I don't think that person's a genius or I don't think that Nobel Prize was worthy. It's a claim and we must face the claim. To say something like that makes a claim about the person, makes a claim about their embodied program. What do they stand for? So I just gave you the two examples that you've seen probably already. Moses has, as a predestined child, has this miraculous salvific uh, saved from the Nile. And then over on the other side, you have Romulus and Ramus, abandoned sons of Mars, of course, Mars to the left, and nurtured by the she-wolf, found by a shepherd. All of that you would want to say is, of course, these are descriptions of predestined child. So then moving to the next one. By the way, look at those two images. I, I've chosen two to be fair. The one on the left, the marble one, is from the Hermitage Museum in um, St. Petersburg. Augustus is holding scepter and orb. That's why you still, <laughs> maybe next year, with King Charles, we'll see scepter and orb. The scepter comes from the spear of command. That's where it's... And that orb in his right hand originally would have had a bronze symbol of victory, probably not looking towards us, but looking towards him with a, a laurel wreath put on him. So that's making a claim victor of the world, not just victor of Rome, Italy, Mediterranean, victor over the world. And then Jesus, look at his <laughs> designation similar, his Halo is cruciform. I moved it up so the two heads are more or less in the same level. But the halo is always cruciform. So you're never allowed to separate uh, crucifixion and resurrection because when you do, you get neither. Also, you look at his hand, his fingers. They're raised in blessing. Three fingers up, two fingers down, Trinity and the two natures. But all he has in his hand is the book. And you'll notice he's never reading the book because he's the norm of the book. He doesn't have to read it. It's always closed or open towards us. So, point. Among predestined children, the infancy of Jesus was presented in confrontation with the Roman tradition for conception and our birth and our coming of age. So anyone in the first century would have recognized like today, if you said of a politician, he or she thinks he or she was born in the log cabin. I think if somebody said that, we'd figure probably that's not information about their birthplace. It's probably a criticism that they think they're Lincoln because born in the log cabin has come to have that meaning. So it's a competition between two predestined children. And therefore, what we have to say is what claim is being made by each. And sorry if I'm pounding this on the head, but if you say of, of a politician that they, that politician is a chicken, that politician is a vulture, that politician is an eagle, each of those is a metaphor. And in each case, you're making a claim <laughs> which could get you into serious trouble, <laughs> even physical trouble. 
it's never taken literally, of course, nobody's talking about feathers and claws, but they are making claims. Okay, enough about that. We'll go to the next one. So, beginning with Matthew then. Matthew depicts Jesus's infancy in confrontation with the Roman Empire, focusing on Herod the Great. That's how it's done. And you'll you recognize the Salerno Ivories, by the way, I'm using here. The one to the left is the the slaughter of the innocents and then the flight into Egypt on the right. So Matthew's way of confronting the Roman Empire is focusing on Herod the Great. All right, moving to the next one. This from Josephus. Anthony, I'm quoting him now. Anthony, this is Mark Anthony, of course. This is when Mark Anthony and Octavian were still <laughs> more or less, more or less, I don't want to say friends, that's way too much. Not at war, let me put it this way. So we're around the year 40 BCE. Anthony determined to make Herod king of the Jews. That's the title given by Rome. Caesar proved the yet more ready champion than Anthony. So they're both in agreement. Herod should be king. Then Anthony and Caesar left the Senate house with Herod, proceeded by the consuls and magistrates and processioned up to offer sacrifice and to lay the decree king of the Jews in the capital. Now it's hard to imagine anything more solemn than that. They just didn't send him an email saying you're king of the Jews and good luck. They went through the whole program and there on the left from the um, reconstruction of the first century Rome that's in the one of the museums in Rome. This is the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. That's the Capitoline Hill in Rome, the Temple of Jupiter, the best and the greatest. So Herod is about as official as you can think of as King of the Jews. So moving then to the next one. And then the Magi come to Herod. And as you know this, they ask, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? Which between ourselves, as you well know, is about the unwisest thing that a wise person could ever do. If they knew their literature, <laughs> you don't go up and ask any king ever, where is your successor? Because sometimes, as we know, people don't like their successor. They might want to stay as king of the Jews, if you see what I mean. For we observe the star, it's rising, come to pay him homage. So anyone reading that knows this is an immense clash and must be asking themselves, should be asking themselves, well, if we have a king of the Jews, why do we want another one? You know, what's the difference? Is it just another type of Herod or is it different? You're really asking yourself, or you should be, what is the embodied program? The incarnate platform. If these two guys were running to be president, we said, what's your platform? What would be that of Herod and what would be that of Jesus? So moving then. Jesus then, of course, is king of the Jews because he's born of the Holy Spirit versus Herod, king of the Jews, because appointed by the Roman Senate. That is really a point where I, I would have to say 100% religious and 100% political. I, I wouldn't even want to say 50-50. It's like the two sides of the same coin. One side is, is all po politics, the other side is all religion. King of the Jews, born of the Holy Spirit, king of the Jews appointed by Rome, as it were, your choice. And then the next time, you mentioned this before, the next time in Matthew, when you run into the title, King of the Jews, here it is. Jesus stood before the governor. Governor asked him, are you the King of the Jews? This is good old Pilate. Jesus said, you say so. They mocked him saying then again, King of the Jews, second time. Then finally over his head, the charge, King of the Jews. And this makes absolute Roman sense. If somehow the accusation is that Jesus claimed to be King of the Jews, that is absolute subversion, treason, and he should be executed. So from, from their point of view, the logic makes quite clear. All right, then moving. 
So looking at the second one then, the second mode of confrontation, Matthew confronts in terms of who's king of the Jews. Um, that puts him, as I say, in collision with Rome. Luke now depicts Jesus' infancy story, again in confrontation with the Roman Empire, but about peace on earth. And look at that image. We, we see it again in a few minutes. It's from the Arapachus Augusti, the altar of Augustan peace in Rome. Look at how the Romans imagine peace. It's not, I mean, it's magnificent in plain language. First of all, the center is a beautiful matron with her children on her lap. She's quite safe. She's not going to be raped. That's what's going to happen in warfare. Yeah, soldiers get killed. Women get raped. Children get either enslaved or slaughtered. They're quite safe. They're on her lap. Down at her feet is the whole land all around her well-fed animals they're quite safe they know they know that one of the bad effects of war is the land is devastated animals are killed then the on the left is the sky you can see symbolized by the goddess of the sky as it were with her um, veil over her and she's been raised up on a and i don't know a swan or a goose or whatever and then over on the other side is the sea you can see the the sea animal so this is a magnificent piece, land, sea, sky, and people. So it's not like, well, <laughs> this is the Arapaches Auguste, the altar of Augustan peace. Again and again in Rome, they simply call this, if you use the Latin term, Arapaches. No, it's the altar of Augustan peace, not just the Pax Romana. So when you start talking about peace on earth, you run into the same problem with Luke, as we did with Matthew, but we've got it already. How, how, how could somebody bring peace on earth if we've got it? And then you must be talking about a different type of peace or something, or else you're redundant. So moving on then. All right. Let me compare then, in especially in Luke, the three different ways, conception, birth, and coming of age, the contrast between Jesus and Augustus in plain language. And of course, he wasn't Augustus, obviously, when he, when he was conceived and born, he was Octavian, but anyway. So if Jesus will be great, called the son of the most high. Okay, that's fair enough as one of Caesar's title. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Okay, that's from Jesus. Now, look over to the story of the conception. I'm talking now about the conception of Augustus, of Octavian. His mother, Atsia, came in the middle of the night to the solemn service of Apollo. So she's in Apollo's temple. She fell asleep. Again, the sermon must be too long. A serpent glided up to her. I spare you any Freudian subtext. She awoke and purified herself as if after the embraces of her husband discreet way of saying she had intercourse with the servant. In the 10th month after that, Augustus was born and was therefore regarded as the son of Apollo. And all of that is extremely important. Could have been the son of Zeus or anyone else. So the fact that he's the son of Apollo is as important as the son of the Holy Spirit. That's a content. Apollo is the God of prophecy. He's the God of accuracy with the arrow. He's the God of order. And I, every time I see a picture of Apollo, if I just look at the head, I don't know if I'm looking at a man or a woman. I don't think he's, he's not her, hermaphroditic, but Apollo is very interesting. It's not Zeus and it certainly isn't Mars. So what you're the son of is also sending a content message about your program. So then moving to the next one, that's conception. Then the next one with regard to the birth, the birth of Jesus. You know what the angel said to them, bringing you good news, great joy for all the people. Born this day in the city of David, a savior. Okay, that's again another title of Augustus, savior of the world after um, the battle of Axiom, who is Messiah the Lord. The one title, of course, that is Jesus's is Messiah, I mean, that is not uh, that of Augustus, 
and Augustus Imperator is the one title he has that Jesus never has. Okay, on the birthday of Augustus. On the day the baby was born, Nigidius, a man unrivaled at discerning the order of the celestial sphere, okay, kind of a magi type, ran into Octavius. That's the father, the father of Octavian, who's just been conceived by, by um, Apollo. When Nigidius asked him why he was late for the Senate meeting, learned the cause, baby was born, and he said, you have fathered a master over us. Octavius was alarmed at this. I love this one. I wanted to destroy the infant. Of course, that's part of the story. If you're watching this as a soap opera on television, you recognize that that's what you're supposed to do. The kid's a threat. You plan to kill him. Octavius was alarmed at this and wanted to destroy the infant, but Nigidius restrained him, saying that it was impossible for it to suffer such a fate. Okay, so the birth parallel, and then going to the next one, and this is only in Luke, of course, the coming of age. And you know the coming of age story in Luke, when he was 12 years old, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And you may remember last week talking about Luke, that Josephus made the same claim for himself at the age of 14. I do think that Luke may well know Josephus and 12 against 14, that means gotcha, gotcha Josephus. We did it two years earlier. All right, Augustus coming of age, that's putting on the toga. When Augustus was celebrating his coming of age, the senatorial gown split down the seams <laughs> and fell at his feet. Okay, that's pretty subtle. Some interpreted this as a sure sign that the order of senators, signified by the toga, would be made subject to him. All of this, of course, written, I think even it comes up as far as I remember, the deified Augustus only tells you all of these stories when he's telling you about the death of Augustus. So he doesn't tell you all this stuff up front, but after you've gone through the life of Augustus, you're kind of ready to believe these signs of his importance. All right, so we move to the next one. Imagine this. What we are looking at here is the Campus Marcius, as it's called, the, the Field of Mars. It was called that because this is where the legions uh, trained, I guess is the best word for it. It unfortunately is also the floodplain of the Tiber, so I'm never quite sure of the wisdom of building anything there, but in any case, the roadway you're looking at, we're looking to south, and this is the Flaminian Way, which is the main north entrance into ancient Rome. It's more or less the same as the Corso Maximo today, if you're in the Piazza del Popolo and you're going south towards Victoria Manuel. Okay, when we were students there, we called it the fruitcake. You're going towards the Victoria Manuel Monument. You'd be, you'd be going down the Via Flaminia, as it were. So the idea was that in 9 BCE, Augustus would be coming in along the Via Flaminia, having just fixed up the uh, Spanish and French parts of the Roman Empire. As he came down that road on his, what be on his right as he's going south, he would see this Ara Pacis Augusti, the altar of Augustan peace. And as he walked past it, he would see his altar of his peace. And also, by the way, the, the, uh, the obelisk there, the, when the sun hit the top, tip of the obelisk, it went right into the front of the, the uh, Arapaches onto his altar on 23rd of September, his birthday. So there's a huge amount of, I don't know if you want to call it mythology, legend, I would call it theology, built around Augustus's conception, birth, and coming of age, and this, of course, is peace, which, be, which is the reason for everything. Also down in the, in the other corner, that's his mausoleum, which he started constructing almost right away. So th this is Augustus's taking over of the Campus Marcius, okay? 
We're moving to the next one. This is just fast. The Arapaches Auguste, we see it today in white marble. It would have been originally colored. And if you happen to be there at the right time, now they're using laser beams to show you what the color was like. Though in, in my experience, you have a 50-50 chance of hitting it at the, at the right time and seeing it. This is a working altar. It's not just an ornament. It's a working altar. There's holes for the blood to flow it. If you see the cutaway picture, you can see the altar is surrounded by a balustrade with four major images on it. These are at the four corners. The bottom is all a floral decoration and then processions at the top coming towards. The processions are coming towards the opening because that's into the altar. And then the four ones on either side. So the first one would be on the right top layer of your images. This represents religion. This is Aeneas arriving and offers, offering sacrifice for a successful journey led by Venus's star from Troy to Italy. And it was prophesied that he would offer sacrifice of a sow and its litter, and that's what he's doing. Then moving down to the next one, bottom left, you see war. So after religion comes war, with the gods on your side, you go to war. Mars, as we saw before, the Romulus and Ramus children, and then the shepherd who found them suckled by the she-wolf. Then moving to the next one, the middle, bottom, you have, uh, so religion, war, victory. That's Roma, the goddess Roma. She's sitting on the arms of her conquered enemy. And to your left, viewer left, is the Senate. You can see the, the toga. And to the right is the people. So it's the victory surrounded by the Senate and people of Rome. And then we've seen this before. This is the magnificent and the best preserved of them. Actually, a lot of the others are really badly damaged. The best preserved is peace. So this is the Roman mantra, motto, slogan, program, platform. In succession, religion, war, victory, peace. Religion first, then with the gods on your side, you go to war. With the gods on your side in war, you get victory. And that gives peace. Going to the next one. Now, this is a slightly different competing form of peace. Suddenly there was an angel, multitude of the heavenly host, praising God, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. This is a tricky phrase. It should be considered as a redundancy. Peace on earth means the favor of God. It's not that peace only comes to the few chosen ones that God will give it to. Peace on earth is God's favor. So if you have peace, you have God's favor. If you have God's favor, you have peace. It's a parallel poetry, as it were. Moving to the next one, then. Now, here is what's at stake. The Roman mantra, and I am not, not mocking it. Remember what we said? The legions were on the periphery, on the Rhine, the Danube, the Euphrates. In between was the Arapache, or not the Arab, but the Pax Augustana, the Augustan peace or the Roman peace. And it was. So even the idea of somebody coming up with another concept of peace, an open-minded first century Roman would have said, I don't know what you're talking about, Paul. We have peace. We have a son of God. We have Lord. How can you have another one? So to understand what a Paul, for example, or anyone else has to do, they have almost a claim that what they're doing is not absurd. It's not a question, do we believe your program? It's kind of, how could you have a program? We already got one. How could there be another one? Then moving from there. Now, we're ready to, for the second half. Bethlehem birth. So the virginal, what's at stake in the virginal conception is a wholly different program for earth. That's what we're talking about. You're perfectly free to say, I don't believe in either of them. I think they're all, but whatever. A claim has been made by Caesar 
a claim has been, for Caesar, at least you want to put it that way, a claim has been made for Jesus. They are claim and counterclaim. That's why the Romans, quite rightly, are going to consider these people dangerous, and their leaders at least, their leaders, don't overdo it, their leaders will be put to death. All right, so the second thing we want to talk about is Bethel and birth. And you know, this is only in Matthew and Luke. Paul, for example, mentions that Jesus was born of David according to the flesh and almost, you know, puts it like that, according to the flesh, let's get on with crucifixion and resurrection, what really counts. But he's no, nobody's made the move to Bethlehem. So Davidic identity comes first, then Bethlehem birth is a kind of a, a metaphor within a metaphor, but both of them have it. And even John mentions it. So over on the left, Matthew, born in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem, 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 Bethlehem. Okay, we can say, okay, we got it. I don't know, one, two, three, I don't know if, if I got that right. There's just five mentions of Bethlehem, which is another thing you'd expect, as we saw with the five prophecies, five dreams, and five unusual women from Matthew. And then over on the other side with Luke, the city of David called Bethlehem to Bethlehem, mentions it twice. And then John saying that Jesus of Nazareth should be born in Bethlehem. So, okay, we've got it. it it's, it's there, but it's definitely post-Pauline. Moving to the next one. So question, what's at stake in this? How historically did Jesus happen to be born in Bethlehem of Judah? According to these two authors, I don't think he was. I think Jesus was born in Nazareth. But anyway, Matthew says, because Joseph and Mary lived there. Matthew takes it for granted. They lived there and they fled into Egypt. And then when they came back, dreams and prophecies controlling the narrative, they decided to move out of Judea because Archelaus was there. He was equally bad news, which he was probably. And so they moved. They migrated to Nazareth. But as you well know, of course, Luke, who likes to connect all of this to world history and sometimes gets it right, sometimes doesn't, but you know, it's like if you're talking from memory, maybe we mightn't get it right either. He says Joseph had to go there to be registered in this ancestral home for the census of Quirinius. Yes, there was a census of Quirinius, as you all know, in 6 CE when they fired Archelaus and put in a governor in Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. And the first thing they did was count people. And then moving to the next one. This is a magnificent mosaic from the Cora Museum. Cora, it's a, it's a church that was made into a mu museum and it's magnificently uh, mosaic inside. And in the entrance, the the uh, entranceway is the life of Mary. And this this is, I, I don't think I've ever seen another one like this. This is Joseph and Mary. And it seems like almost Mary is the one who's been registered for Luke's story of the, <laughs> the coming to, to Bethlehem. But by the way, in Josephus' Jewish Antiquities, he makes it quite clear that the census is for property. It's not for people. It's not a poll tax, a head tax, it's a property tax. So once again, as you well know, none of Luke's story about why and that and how and where they went to Bethlehem has to do with history. All right, then moving on. So what we're trying to do is find out what exactly is at stake here. Why theologically now? We saw historically how it happened in the story. Why theologically did Jesus have to be born in Bethlehem, Judah, Judea? Matthew says, Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David. And of course, Joseph is the son of David. And this is fascinating. So by the way, Matthew sees no problem with him being born of the Holy Spirit and also being in effect born of Joseph. Otherwise, he ain't the son of David. He has no Davidic ancestry, ancestry excuse me, except through Joseph. There's no contradiction for them. Any more than there was a contradiction that Octavian was the son of Octavius, 
and born of Apollo, like, excuse me, conceived of Apollo. So Luke, Joseph of the house of David, ancestor David, savior, servant David, city of David, descended from the house of David. Okay, okay, we got it, Luke, we got it, okay. City of David, a savior who is the Messiah of the Lord. So both of them insist on Bethlehem. That is their way of saying of Davidic ancestry. And behind that, of course, what's important is he is the Davidic Messiah. So we're probing backwards from Bethlehem to David, asking always, what was at stake for them? So moving to the next one. You remember this, uh, the Western Wall in Dura Europa, is a magnificent synagogue that is reconstructed in its own little house in the uh, museum at Damascus. I don't know if it's ever open now. It, we were only there once in, in 2010s, I think I told you, and it was closed for repairs, maybe for safety as well. There, if you look at the Torah shrine, immediately to the right of the Torah shrine, that little scene there is the anointing of David. And it's right next to the scene that we saw from, it was, was it Matthew? Yes, the, the story of the finding the birth of Jesus mirroring the birth of Moses, as you remember. So the two of them are side by side. Going to the next one. All right, here's what's at stake there. That's the story of David among his brothers being chosen and anointed, as you can see. Here's the background. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for a king among his sons. This is what's happening to Samuel. He's been sent to choose David. David was the son of an Ephratite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight sons. You, O Bethlehem of Ephrata, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you comes forth from me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. So we have Bethlehem and we have David. So the city of David is Bethlehem. And then moving to the next one. All right, since Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2 have Jesus born in Bethlehem, the city of David, to symbolize that he is the promised Davidic Messiah, does that mean that Jesus is to lead violent resistance against the Romanization of his homeland? After all, remember that image of David that we looked earlier, Granted, he was scything, as I said, to use his slingshot against Goliath, but certainly David was not a, a non-violent resistor against the Philistines. He was a liberator by armed resistance, if you want to say assisted by God, by all means. So what are we saying to say that Jesus is the Davidic Messiah? We're getting now down and down deeper into what's at stake in all of this. So moving to the next one. And I want to introduce my friend and colleague, fellow Irisher, John Collins, Yale University, in his book of 1995, The Scepter and the Star, which is very, very clear. The concept, it's like asking this question. If you went around first century Israel, say the first 25 years and asked everyone in the street, what's this Davidic Messiah to you? Not the, not the elites, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, but the ordinary people. What did it mean to think Davidic Messiah? The concept of the Davidic Messiah as the warrior king who would destroy the enemies of Israel and institute an era of unending peace constitutes the common core of Jewish messianism around the turn of the era. That I think is the clearest, most succinct and most accurate answer to what the Davidic Messiah is. And you know, it sounds a little bit like Caesar. There will be peace, of course. None of this is to enjoy war, but it is war for peace. Again, he says that at the very beginning, if you look at the pages, and then he brings it up again at the end of that volume. There was a dominant notion of a Davidic Messiah 
as the king who would restore the kingdom of Israel, which was part of the common Judaism around the turn of the era. That's the common mainstream. Now, going to the next one. I'm just looking at a reissue of the book from 2010. Two other statements that were also in the original. I don't mean this was added, but just to use two different images. Although the claim that he, Jesus of Nazareth, is the Davidic Messiah, is ubiquitous in the New Testament, he does not fit the typical profile of the Davidic Messiah. This Messiah was, first of all, a warrior prince who was to defeat the enemies of Israel. Now, John is talking about, not talking about the Messianic, Christic tradition. He's talking primarily about the intertestamental period. So these are almost, almost like throwaway lines at the beginning and end of the book. Look at the pages, page 13 and 204. There is little, if anything, in the gospel portrait of Jesus that accords with the Jewish expectation of a militant Messiah. So now all of a sudden we have a, a Davidic Messiah who, who doesn't seem to fit the job profile of a Davidic Messiah. So moving on from this. Let me pause here and be very, very clear. For violent resistance, the Roman policy was to crucify the leader and his major supporters, as many of them as you could get your hands on that hadn't been killed already. So in Jerusalem, for example, in the uprising of 4 BCE, the death of Herod the Great, 2,000 people were crucified in Jerusalem. Then in the Second Great War of 66 to 74, the fall of Jerusalem in 70, Josephus says, both of these are taken from Josephus, they crucified 500 a day until they ran out of trees. So violent resistance, you go for the leader and the main, we might say, top lieutenants. That's the story of Barabbas, of course, too. He's in, in Mark's parable of Barabbas. He is in jail along with his major supporters because they were uprising against Rome. Moving to the second one. We're very, very much to the heart of understanding Jesus. For nonviolent resistance, Rome crucified only the leader. They didn't think it necessary. There wasn't being merciful. Why bother with the, they would have said, to, with the riffraff? Nonviolent resistors, we crucify the leader, they'll get the message, and that'll be the end of them. Here's their, from Julius Paulus, legal opinions he's collected for his own son. This is probably around the year 200. These are legal opinions, opinion in the sense of a legal opinion, not just, you know, here's what I think. This is a judgment, you might say. The author, and it's in the section on seditious people, on seditious people. The authors of sedition and tumult are those who stir up the people shall, according to their rank, I love that, either be crucified, thrown to wild beasts, or deported to an island. It's almost one of the most important Roman quotations to understand what happened to Jesus. He is a author of sedition. That's exactly what they would see of him. He creates tumor. He, we will call him an activist. He's not a philosopher. The philosophers could criticize all they wanted about wealth and anything else, the, the cynic philosophers or even the stoic philosophers, eh, they might boot them out of town every now and then if you got annoyed. Rome didn't crucify philosophers. They crucified activists, the leader. So going to the next one. This is why both Josephus and Tacitus, at Josephus in the 90s and Tacitus in the 110s, when they're trying to explain about Christ, and they're only doing that because Christians are still around and they want to know who are these Christians, both of them feel it necessary to explain why that didn't work. When they tell the story of how we crucified the leader, 
Well, that should have ended it. So now we're, what, 60, 70, 80 years later, and these followers are still around. So what went wrong? Josephus' answer, Jesus, this is his whole account, won over many Jews, many of the Greeks. Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing amongst us. That, I think, is the most accurate statement ever made about what happened. Yes, the men of the highest standing amongst us, that would be the high priestly circles, fearing what Jesus might bring down upon them, accused them to Pilate. I think that is right. But, of course, only Pilate could have crucified. Only Pilate could have put Jesus to death, had condemned him to be crucified. On the other hand, says Tacitus, Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. Now, each of them, moving to the next one, has to explain what went wrong. And I goof there because what, what went wrong, according to Josephus, there should be a slide in there. When I was correcting it, I took it out by mistake. Josephus explains that after this was done, what happened was those who loved him before continued to love him afterwards. And love in that political sense means loyalty. So you could translate it, those who are loyal to him before continue to be loyal to him afterwards. And the tribe of Christians to this day has not disappeared. So that's Josephus's explanation of why, even though we crucified the leader, it just didn't work because the followers still stuck to him. Over on the other side, good old Tacitus, who seldom has a sneer too far from his lips or his pen, says, well, it was a disease, and disease spreads contagion, and eventually everything rotten comes to Rome eventually. Okay, fine. Josephus is polite, Tacitus sneers, but both of them have to admit something went wrong with the Roman program that if you crucify the leader, that's the end of it. <laughs> or as Pilate might have said, what, what happens in Jerusalem stays in Jerusalem. Not in this case, something went wrong. So moving to the next one. I wanted to end with this. Uh, you may know Rainer Maria Rilke, the poet, his letters to a young poet, they were if you look at the dates, I mean, he's not that much younger, barely 10 years, but they both had been students. Rilke had been a student at a, uh, a school for people going into the army, re required services. And he's writing to this other person, Franz Eber Kapos, and luckily he kept the letters. So I want to look at two letters to conclude with this and conclude the whole series if we move to the next one. I suspect you know the letter on the left. At least you probably know the phrase, loving the questions. This is a letter written on July the 16th of 1903. And he's telling the young poet, try to love questions, questions themselves. Think of them like locked rooms and like books that are written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers or Press the answers, because you would not be able to live them. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. That's letter four. And I think a lot of questions do know that because they might recognize the program loving the questions. Now, I want to look at letter six. It's the Christmas letter that Rilke sends to his young poet friends, Wednesday, December the 23rd, 1903. And it links all the way back to the opening on the first one where we were looking at La Sagrada Familia in, in Catalan, Barcelona. And you were trying to imagine with, with Gaudi immersing religion in evolution and specifically emerging, merging the birth of Jesus out of nature, out of evolution itself, almost like an organic fruit from a tree. Says Rilke, 
why do you not think of him, Jesus, as the coming one, imminent from all eternity, the future one? the final fruit of a tree whose leaves we are. If you'll allow me to repeat, the final fruit of a tree whose leaves we are. What keeps you from projecting his birth into times that are in process of becoming and living your life like a painful and beautiful day in the history of a great gestation? <laughs> And as you can see, he gives you a question. <laughs> his, his Christmas letter is again a question, and you have to love the question to see if you can live into it. All right, I think there is just one concluding image, and it's the one, of course, going back to La Sagrada Familia and to the Catalan Matthew and the Catalan Luke from inside and to Jesus coming forth through the two of them, hidden behind them. And with that, I think we can open it for questions, Trip, please. And thank you for getting all of those up so smoothly. All right. Thank you, Dom. Thank you. Um, now, everyone that is on the live stream, feel free to drop in your questions. There were uh, uh, some of them that were sent in when we were going to look at Matthew and Luke related to these parts, okay. you know, that were uh, saved uh, for now. So I'll start with a couple of those to give everyone that's on the stream a chance to do questions. And then I'll go okay. back and forth from sent this week to <laughs> uh, the, the ones live. Um, but uh, one of the, uh, one of the themes that came up in a number of questions was uh, what to do with the stark contrast that you draw here between the claim that Caesar is son of God, the one who establishes peace through victory and violence in this picture, and um, the way in which both Matthew and Luke in different ways insist that uh, there is this alternative program and alternative reality uh, 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 that functions as an invitation for the people of Christ to live into. Um, as someone who isn't just experiencing this contrast for the first time, but uh, a scholar who's wrestled with these texts and attempting to, to let these texts question us in the present, what kind of advice, wisdom, first steps do you have if people want to say yes more faithfully to this, uh, uh, the call that is being evoked in these, um, in these Christmas stories? Challenge, you know, raising the, the bigger framework of power and politics and such. And I can only kind of tell them where I am. I think if we put this as sort of our Christian ethics, as it were, I think the answer can be, well, that's your view. Yeah, good look. You have, you have every right to your opinion. You happen to be wrong, but you know, whatever. What I am watching all the time is how these locomotives, to use my image from four, are running on evolutionary rails. <laughs> Mm -hmm. When I look at evolution, and I mean evolution, I don't mean anything kind of theologically slipped in using that word. What I find is that everything in evolution works from the bottom up and gives an absolutely fair share to everything, a fair chance to everything, including stuff like viruses that I'm not big on giving fair chances to, actually. So this is the vision of the world the Caesar vision of the world is a world is a vision that isn't working. I think Caesar could have said quite plausibly, and I wouldn't have much of an answer. It's working. We have the Pax Romana. Now, the Jew who's coming from a little experience and knows his Daniel chapter two and chapter seven mm -hmm. knows what's happened to the, the Babylonians. As I said, that the it doesn't mention the Assyrians, Babylonians, Medes, Persians you know, knows that somehow or other these don't work, these empires, and they may say because God punishes them, fine. That's their explanation. It's not mine. My explanation is because they're not tracking with evolution. They're doomed. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long, how long, but I do not see anything that works totally from the top down ever working in the long haul. That's where I am. And it's not an ethical decision. It's not pride. It's not, it simply doesn't track with evolution. So you're trying to you're trying to do something that can't be done in the long haul. 
So I would ask them to widen it out. To don't try and say, well, this is our view and there's another view on whichever view. I, I think, for example, if you start thinking of what I've said before, when our species came out of Africa, we declared war on the world and we really mm -hmm. got away with it for 100,000 years with regard to the environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it would have been silly to even raise it. And the Bible doesn't raise this. The Bible talks about war for certain. And it's aware, like, the, the, the peace, as the Romans knew, that war is bad <laughs> for living things. But but they, they didn't have a glimpse that there was anything else there, that we were really, the, on, the primary onslaught was on the environment. And that war was almost like a second secondary threat. Reading the Bible, you think it's the only threat. So mm -hmm. I would ask people to raise their eyes and look at the whole environment, the world, spe other species, and ourselves, and put that in there. And I'm trying to imagine what I call post-civilization. I have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what it would be like. But the Bible clearly has glimpsed it, because if they talk about beating their swords at the plowshares and all of that, they've glimpsed it. Mm -hmm. But one of the big questions in my mind is how did these people glimpse something to at last darkly? Why didn't they sit, why didn't the biblical tradition simply say, wait your turn, eventually we're going to get an empire. Everyone gets an empire, eventually we get an empire and get to beat everyone else up. Mm -hmm. Why did they ever come up with the idea that the world should be a just place? You don't get that from any experience in human history. So all I can see, these were like intuitions of evolution. And I don't want to say more than that. I don't want to say, oh, they're really glimpsing. No, I think they had, there were people who began to see somehow or other, this doesn't seem to be working well. And the way I put it in Render unto Caesar is it's, it's not that we have an original sin. It's we have an original state that we are, we are a community with individual wills. Mm -hmm. and that's almost like an evolutionary joke or an evolutionary challenge, if you want to be more yeah. what, what? How can you have a social species with individual wills? Won't we always pull towards our own way? Or won't we always pull in the opposite mm -hmm. ways? Won't it be tyranny or anarchy? Well, as a species, we have to walk a tightrope between tyranny and anarchy. And we ain't doing it too well. Mm -hmm. We really don't. So that's that's the scenario within which we have to put any of this for me. Otherwise, it's just my opinion, your opinion, and it's, they're all they're all equally opinion. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that um, I, I find uh, helpful in raising the question of uh, how do you hear these stories as resonating with the the grain of our species and its ongoing evolution is. Uh, we are growing in our awareness uh, the role of both our biological inheritance as a species, right? Our cognitive right. mechanisms, our biological drives and desires are things that were evolved and functioned in uh, for an environment we're no longer in, right? In Africa. But on top of that, uh, we also are a symbolic species that we communicate. We pass down wisdom. Through our communication, we actually free, we give the world interpreted to every child when they learn our language, which comes with all its symbols. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the we never experience the world directly. It's always come in this kind of interpretive mm -hmm. way. And uh, I, I think there is a kind of brilliance to say, um, what if what we treat as natural and normal? the stories we live out in our lives are actually uh, idols of death that are against our own well-being, the well-being of our neighbor and our enemy, mm -hmm. right? Like part of what I heard uh, presented so powerfully today is to go like, the, the, do you want to know the truth claims that are being made here? It's asking us when, what is genuine peace? One of them is established through violence and, uh, and threats to the other. And the other one comes to the establishment of justice that doesn't generate the death to new enemies, like as you conquer. That yeah. invitation, I think, is the, like, what would it mean then to be a community that stayed, like you said, stayed in love, stayed loyal to this picture 
of the, uh, that you see in the ministry of Jesus. It, it is a community that has resisted calling this world Caesar's set to peace that he made right and this kind of thing. Um, I, I, I find that to be wonderfully exciting. And we can even see places in history where people that would never use our theological language as Christians about Jesus resonate with the very truth that's yes. being proclaimed here. I'm, I have not the slightest intention or need to say, well, this is Christianity. Is right. it? No, it's just my responsibility, first of all, as a historian, to mm -hmm. tell the truth as I see it. And as a theologian, to tell the truth, because Jesus is a theologian. I can't let on. He's just walking around patting babies and you know, telling little stories. But also, I think the Christian vision tracks well with evolution. Otherwise, I would simply say, well, it's very interesting, but it's, you know, irrelevant. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, so one of the one of the other questions um, here is uh, you mentioned in Matthew uh, that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit and yet goes through the line of David via Joseph. Yeah. Um, is is that something worth noticing in trying to understand the kind of historicity or claims being made by Matthew? I really think it is because, it, as I said, you have the same thing where Octavius, I mean, his inheritance came to Octavius. You know, it wasn't like, well, you're not my father, Apollo is, or whatever you want to say it like that. I mean, we we know a lot more about the biology of the sperm and the egg than they mm -hmm. knew or I'd eating whenever. I don't even know when we find that out. So they probably would have had no I no problem with what we might call natural conception and also a God doing it at the same time somehow. I mean, they didn't know even enough about the genes and everything else that we might raise questions like where half the genes, you know, were missing or something. None of those, they were blissfully unaware of that. So they could imagine that, yes, he is descended from David. And if you push them and said, well, does that mean that Joseph was the genetic, you know, the father? Of course. Well, then how could the Holy Spirit be the father? They probably would have looked at you and said, What's your problem? Literally, like you said, well, is he Octavius' son or is he Apollo's son? I think they would they honestly would not have understood the problem. Like as if we were to say, if we could use it, well, he was born of so-and-so and he's the president. Well, yeah, if he wasn't the president, we was born. You know, mm -hmm. This is a title given retroactively. So we have to accept it, but... What I'm pleading all the time for is to take seriously the claim. And if, if somebody said to me, well, I want to take literally that Jesus was the son of God, as if God somehow is a person who intervened in the biology of Mary, then I would simply say, fine, fine. Then take equally seriously that Apollo intervened in the biology of Atsia. Now we have both literal sons of God, and we're back where we started. <laughs> mm. Take them both metaphorically. Take them both literally, but don't cheat and say, oh, well, our Christian one is literal, but their one, of course, is mythical or whatever term you use. That is not what anyone could have said in the first century, because in the first century, they did believe that miracles or marvels could happen. And there was no more weird, theoretically, that yeah. the Holy Spirit could produce a Jesus <laughs> than Apollo produce an Augustus. Now, you might mm -hmm. say, I don't believe your guy. I don't believe... Jesus is, is a divine son, but I couldn't tell you it couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't tell me it was yeah. unique. So if uniqueness is out and an impossibility is out, then we're in an open forum where you have to persuade me that it's more important for me that Jesus is Lord, Son of God, all this, than the Caesar is. Can I do it? They did it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so in, in, in some sense, our... Uh... Uh, the way we ask about the truth of these type of uh, stories has been overdetermined, and especially in America, I think, by um, by the virgin conception being on the list that the fundamentals uh, made kind of necessary, and then it's set up for fights in every denomination. And um, in, in what you're highlighting is, like, if you just ask any of the biblical writers at the time, is this possible, um, they, then you kind of are starting on the wrong foot. But if you want to assume... It, it's true. What 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 uh, the the truth that Matthew and Luke are asserting is not 
that no other miracles ever happened whatsoever, but this one did. Therefore, Jesus is right. It's uh, it's actually that this this articulation of the world and um, and the call to faithfulness in it is more true than the one that's being inscribed and justified yeah, in the other telling. It's name of faith. Mm -hmm. it's, it's faith against faith. It's not faith against proof. You, people can actually see it in the middle of the second century, around 150, and Justin Martyr, when he's writing uh, apologetics for Christianity, and he says, open me, we are no, we are making no more weird claim that Jesus is born of a virgin, descendant of heaven, than you guys make of your emperor who ascended into heaven. Now, for sure, Justin thinks his claim is much more important, but he, he can't say, well, we have a unique claim, yours is wrong. He's willing to come out and pitch and say, okay, your guy deserves the Nobel Prize, our guy deserves the mm -hmm. Nobel Prize, but our Nobel Prize is much more important because you invented dynamite. <laughs> We invented cure for cancer. So you're pitching in there and you have to, you, you cannot pull impossibility. That doesn't happen. You can't do that because nobody believe you. So you cannot also pull uniqueness. Our Jesus ascended to heaven mm -hmm. and never happened in the whole His. You can tell a story that makes it sound as if it was never happened before, but everyone will understand you're saying this is much more important, more mm -hmm. valuable. There are um, a number of different questions around the different titles of uh, used in both birth stories and um, how they get appropriated either, say, for Herod um, in Matthew or for uh, Augustus in Luke. Um, could you kind of just kind of like briefly sketch them out? Uh, because there are a number of little questions, I think, just what's going on in the use of the titles and um, which which of the ones that are most you know familiar for people in liturgical space uh, have their origin in this contrasting visions of kind of uh, divine plans and divine invitations? Okay, well, people have argued that a lot of these titles for Jesus could come out of the left the Septuagint in the Bible, and that's true. Lord, I mean, if Caesar was called Führer or something else. Lord could come out. It's just that the when they're all put together, it's too pointed. If Caesar never existed, Jesus could be called Lord. He could be called Son of God because um, God talks to Moses that you know, by taking his people out of Israel, let my son go. So Israel is the Son of God collectively because Son means the heir. So a lot of these titles could be understood. And by the way, I have started using messianic hyphen christique to avoid the term christian in case it means you know that time later when they're two separate religions mm -hmm. but are making messianic and that's simply an anglicization of the hebrew and aramaic and christic c-h-r-i-s-t-i-c is a simply anglicization of the greek so we're talking about messianic christic jews at mm -hmm. this stage so messiah is a title that's unique to jesus i don't think would ever have used that of Caesar. And the corresponding one for Caesar is the Imperator, which doesn't mean emperor, it means victor, world victor, actually. So each of them has a title that's unique, but then there's all of these in between. But the point where you cross the line is when Paul is writing and he calls Jesus the Lord. Rome had no problem with everyone having their own little Lord or even their own little sons of God. Your own little redeemer. All of these they would recognize as this little religious group over there has its Lord. Of course, when you start cruising backwards and forwards between our Lord, the Lord, our Lord, the Lord, every time you cross that line, that's treason. Because mm -hmm. you're not saying our Lord. This is just our little Lord over here, stuck in the corner of you know of the Mediterranean in Israel. It's our little Lord. No, it's the difference between. You're in the school board and you have a president. Fine, no problem calling him the president. Just don't walk around Washington saying out loud, I'm the president. See what happens to the Secret Service when you do that. So when you start saying in a certain context, the Lord, everyone recognizes that you're making a claim and that's why you could end up dead. So the title especially it's a usage that makes it really clear. The Son of God, the Lord, 
the redeemer from sin, the savior of the world, we are saying that our guy is and your guy ain't. Oops. <laughs> the uh, um, Do you think that the, you, you, you briefly mentioned at the end how in the trial at Matthew and then um, on the cross you pick up uh, the uh, King, of the King of the Jews line. You briefly mentioned the function of Barabbas as uh, as a parallel um, there. Um, what is the uh, what is the context when these kind of stories? Uh, how does that change the way you frame the ministry and teaching of Jesus when this theological uh, beginning of the birth story, and then the way Matthew uniquely does it re re remembers uh, the you know, the cross um, in ways that kind of pull these threads yeah. of 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 messianic comparisons or Jesus as Davidic Messiah without the army kind of thing. Well, it means then that everything that's in between, first of all, you read within these frames. It's not that he really was fine. You do not, not all of a sudden. Something went wrong in Jerusalem. He got himself crucified by mistake. No, if, the logic of the of the whole story tells you if you don't know the story, you're holding your breath mm -hmm. to see what's going to happen to this guy. But your your general feeling, if you're a good reader, after those openings, is no, this isn't going to go too well. <laughs> this is this sounds a, too much like a counter story, and you don't get away with counter stories. So. From the very beginning, it's not when everything is going fine, fine, fine. He gets to Jerusalem and something goes wrong, or Pilate makes a mistake, or he confused. The logic of the story goes all the way through. So it's perfectly valid then for Paul, in his own way, to take it for granted. I'm not going to even talk about what led up to this, because what led up to this, or, sorry, what <clears throat> what happened was latent in the beginning. Yeah. All the way through and i want to talk paul would say about resurrection so this is like jesus uh, god has qualified this whole thing as the way of the future the way it should be, should be so paul could never separate the two of them crucifixion and, and resurrection and if we have done it done it too much and too often and too easily mm -hmm. that's a problem with our theology mm -hmm. so do you think that um, and Robbie asked this in uh, live, if the, the culmination of Matthew's kind of introductory overture and then at the end asking, right, to choose, bet choose between Barabbas and Jesus, um, if, 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 if that ultimately becomes the part of the gospel's like address to us is again to ask that question. Right, like the that the proc the good news of the gospel is, hey, you, you have to ask this question again um, uh, to to respond to the claim of you know what is uh, what does it mean uh, to pick sides in this? Yeah, I, mean, I call it a parable because look, let me be very clear: no governor could ever offer the Paschal amnesty could say to the crowd, as it were, however you number the crowd, whoever you want, you can get out. That is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> you know, it's like telling somebody, whatever crime you commit, you can be out next Sunday. Anything could happen. So Pilate would be impeached immediately. This is a parable. Mark is writing, say, in the throes of the, the Great War of 66 uh, to 74, Jerusalem has fallen and all the rest of it. And Mark is summing up the history. He said, oh, Jerusalem, you were offered two saviors. Mm -hmm. There was Barabbas and his followers who were freedom fighters. Now, from the Roman point of view, they're, they're rebels and lace days, you know. But from the Jewish point of view, these are freedom fighters. They're in prison, of course, because they're armed, they're violent revolutionaries. Mark asked you to imagine the scene where Pilate is standing here with a violent revolution called Bar Abbas, mm -hmm. the father. And that's almost the giveaway. Why would you want a name like Bar Abbas? That would be like Scandinavians whose name was father son. Well, every father is a son and every son is a father by definition. So that doesn't help you. So Bar Abbas 
asks you to look at the other side of Pilate where the true Bar Abbas is standing. So Mark has Pilate say, oh, Jerusalem, which means, oh, us, which side are you on? Do you think salvation is with the violent revolutionary? And remember, the violent revolutionary against the Roman oppression and everything else, not an evil person. He's imagined as a freedom fighter or the nonviolent revolutionary. Which mm -hmm. side are you on? And when Pilate actually chooses Jesus, Mark is saying, in one sense, <laughs> Pilate made the right decision, but Jerusalem didn't. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the year 70, when the violent revolutionaries brought the Roman down upon them. So, I mean, these people in, in this first century, the, the terrible first century, this was a real problem for them. How do we yeah. oppose the Romans? If we oppose them by violence in the name of David or, you know, Josiah or, or our heroes of old and God will come on our side and God will protect us and everything will work and the, the walls will fall down. And these are dangerous, dangerous stories because mm -hmm. you know, glorified from the past, they now become modes of operation in the in the present and the danger was real danger that after the war of 66 and 74 rome might have declared judaism a forbidden religion mm -hmm. I mean, they came they came very close by making every jew everywhere in the roman empire give a tax towards the temple of jupiter optimus maximus and the capital and heel in rome that's taxing them to support Zeus's temple. That's just one move from saying, okay, you're a forbidden religion. It could mm -hmm. have happened, but Rome at least got it right. And despite four great rebellions against Rome, it never actually forbade the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Susan asked this question, but so did Anthony ask a similar one uh, via email. Um, please talk about why Luke and Matthew wrote these narratives and made these comparisons when they did 80 to 90 or so. Um, and uh, in the other way it was phrased was, uh, if you take these as theological narratives um, and they're in some sense retelling them for their present community uh, using the tensions in a past moment, uh, how did post-temple uh, early Jewish Christian relations with Rome shape uh, how these would be heard. Okay, let me see. Now, there's two parts there. So let me if I forget the second part. When I do the first part. I, I I think the questions of dating are perfectly valid historical questions, but I warn you that the doubts about about those answers shouldn't doubt you about the content. Uh, I think Matthew. Matthew may have been a Pharisee. He certainly was a rabbi and a scribe. He may have been a Pharisee, mm -hmm. I don't know for sure. And he's debating with other Pharisees, I think, after the destruction of the temple. So I see no reason it couldn't be 80 to 90 for Matthew. Secondly, for Luke, I have to think of Luke Acts as a single work, as you know, composed at the same time, imagining the whole. So therefore, I can't put... Um, Gospel according to Luke, say around 80, and the Acts according to 120. I think both of those were conceived as a whole and written probably in the 110s or 120s even of the second century, especially if you think he knows Josephus from the 90s. Okay. Now, in terms of what's going to happen, well, eventually after 300 years, as you know, the Roman Empire is going to join them. Mm -hmm. And what do you do when the empire joins you? Well, you, you, have to, <laughs> you have to make a deal. And unfortunately, the deal was, well, we'll take care of heaven, you take care of the earth. We'll take care of charity, you take care of justice. Um, we'll take care of the soul, you take care of the body. We bifurcated it. You know, maybe, maybe there was nothing else you could do when Constantine joined you and offered to build you churches and everything else. But it was very hard to keep suggesting that Pilate might be like Constantine. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, maybe it was just the pagan Roman Empire was the problem. Now we have a Christian Roman Empire. Ah, so it's all right. So the problem was not empire. The problem was pagan. Yeah. Now that, that's, 
something that never happened in the Old Testament tradition. They never said, well, the problem with the Assyrians and the Babylonians is they're pagans. Now, if we had the Jewish empire, everything would be fine. No, they didn't, they didn't go for a Jewish empire. They went for a just world. So I, I think the danger was once the empire joined them that you negotiated how to live within the empire. Mm -hmm. I, I don't envy them the problem. I really don't. Yeah. It, it reminds me of that, uh, the scene, um, and a couple of people remind, uh, sent this in, that scene in Monty Python's uh, um, The Life of Brian, where the Jewish resistance to Roman occupation are sitting there and they're planning uh, their rather poorly planned attempt to, uh, you know, go get the, uh, 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 go, I think it was to go kidnap someone or whatever and break in the pilot's thing. And they're like, yeah, well, what's Rome ever done for us? And then they sit there and they're like, well, well, the sanitation. Okay. Okay. But beyond the sanitation, they start going through and there's like this giant list of things that as like historically Rome brought these kind of benefits organizations and such to the world. And yet uh, also um, they, they have this means and mechanism of, yeah. of their peace um, in a time now where I think a lot of people who uh, take this, the, the gospel narrative seriously for their own understanding are starting to hear again, the contrast with empire from Moses on through Jesus uh, do you have uh, wisdom as someone who spent a lot of time in those historical periods and have wrestled with this question of power, how these stories can help us um, uh, uh, identify the elements of empire that must be addressed, the places, the kind of nonviolent resistance and fidelity uh, to the one Jesus calls Abba there that, that we're being called into? And uh, like, how do you negotiate uh, the inheritance of a system. Like we're not going to go get rid of the aqueducts, right? Like, <laughs> or we aren't going to get rid of the wine. Oh, it's great. Like in, in, in that scene. Yeah. And that's where we are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's as it's simple as all the magnificent cities we built on the, uh, where the sea, where the sea meets the land. And it's almost impossible to think. I've seen images of what, what it would be like if the sea, sea rises up a bit for, for Miami or for New York or for Washington, for that matter. Um, it, I don't know whether you can get people to take seriously that without them thinking, well, you're apocalyptic, you're dramatic, you're just looking for attention or something like that. Um, but what is it, what is it really stake quite calmly is whether we are a sustainable species or whether we are just a magnificent, but doomed species. That, that's the question we're talking about. And I don't want to obfuscate it with anything else. That's, that's the tradition that has come out as a question against that. Are we a sustainable species? Mm -hmm. And if simply the, the three dimensions of that problem are how we handle the environment, how we handle other species, and how we handle ourselves, or how we handle what the the Bible calls the world, puts it together. It's not thinking discreetly like that. So I, I think those are the questions we, we have to ask ourselves. And they're political, unfortunately, as religious. Mm -hmm. Whether we can do anything about it, is, that's another question. And maybe that it's just too hard for us to handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, now there, so there are a number of really big picture questions that we're going to save for uh, the other um Q and A, um, but there was a uh, a couple people who asked about um, how the church got to something like the Gospel of John, and then to uh, uh, where it seems as if this historical embeddedness of the life of Jesus then is thought theologically, right, retroactively about his birth, and you kind of lay out, and there are these big uh, claims to then. Well, how do we get the kind of claim that happens, right, in the Gospel of John's prologue to then the kind of claim where the birth and Logos eternal is even divorced from the narratives of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John um, in in the creed? Like, is, is, there, is there something to learn that uh, to avoid doing again in that distancing 
Um, or is it, uh, is there, in that undoing, is there wisdom for us trying to re-embed uh, these stories in their historical matrix? Um, the big difference that I see is that the people who wrote, like my, even any of those gospels, were making claims on the future. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how the people who wrote the creeds were trying to make eternal claims because Ooh, otherwise yeah. we wouldn't need so many of them. I think a creed by definition is a, is a sort of a statement. Here is we stand in the present crisis on this. Mm -hmm. And if it does its job, it should be dated. If it really does its job and solves the crisis, then it should be irrelevant maybe 50 years later when there'll be another crisis. It's like you're focusing totally on a COVID vaccine. Fine. That's for this crisis. Mm -hmm. It may have some implications. So I have no problem with a creed because I, I, I locate each of them as sort of contemporary. Mm -hmm. And if it's not temporary, it's a con. <laughs> it's temporary. But temporary things are important. You know, this is what you need right now. If it does its job, it should be irrelevant. So when we take these creeds and try to make them immortal and canonical, I, I, I don't think they can sustain that. Sometimes a vision which claims to be transtemporal and transpatial can, can be, mm -hmm. can work. You can see it. Because I, I know just simply for my own self, I have no vested interest that, that I, I wouldn't say I think you know, we have to say that the New Testament is finally irrelevant. If I thought that, I would say it. Mm -hmm. I would be perfectly happy then to focus on Shakespeare. I, I want somebody big enough <laughs> to keep me happy and interested <clears throat> for my life. It could be somebody else, could be Emily Dickinson just as well. But is there a vision there that somehow is enduring is the question. And I, I think... That's what we have to ask. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can say is one time where I see the biblical tradition and the evolutionary tradition, like two beams crossing, like searchlights, you know, um, is on this subject that things work from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the idea of a small little people on the Levantine coast of the Mediterranean, sort of imagining world peace. I mean, it's, it's coming from the bottom up. It's not coming from Rome down. It's coming from Israel up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's little, little, tiny little people. So what strikes me is that really seems to track with evolution because that's the way I see things that happen. So something which is totally ruled from the top down is probably doomed. And that means that it will have to adjust. Now, it may be able to, to adjust, but if it can't, it is doomed. And maybe another thousand years. But mm -hmm. it, And what about the, um, uh, how does the prologue to John end up connecting to the, um, the resonance you're seeing yeah. between kind of these, uh, the prologues of the Gospels as, as invitations to thinking about um, the, the grain of the universe. Well, let, let me get what, how I think is the proper way to pronounce it. In Archehen Hologos, in, in the beginning was the Logos. You mm -hmm. translate it as the word, I don't know. But Logos was a Greek philosophical term, which meant that the world made sense. That as a philosopher, I yeah, can yeah. make sense. Rather than say, well, it's just a mess and do whatever you want. I'm claiming as a Stoic or a Cynic or whatever, Epicurean, I can make sense of it. So the world is understandable. Now, I think the great discovery was it is understandable to us today in terms of cosmic evolution. It makes sense. There's all sorts of stuff we don't understand, of course. But we really don't think it's totally arbitrary and there's a danger that we'll make up, wake up tomorrow morning and gravity won't work however you call it and explain it. So I think 
the intelligibility in the beginning was the intelligibility of the universe. So as far as we're concerned, as John says, the relationship between God, he's talking about mm -hmm. God, and us is the intelligibility of the universe. Paul's way of saying that is we should be able to figure God out by looking at stuff that is in, in Romans. So, to, but then he goes on to say that the intelligent intelligibility of the universe became incarnate in Jesus. That's the claim that I'm seeing in Rilke's Christmas letter, mm -hmm. <laughs> that somehow it's this nonviolent resistance against violence rather than the the obvious thing if you're violent against me i'll be violent back and so violence escalates 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 until mm -hmm. it threatens the universe and it's all kind of logical that we got there you did this i did this you did this i did that it's, it's like the desert you know blood feud in chapter four of genesis it, it spirals yeah it's out of control and then nobody did it it just happened so when i see john I think John, by the way, is writing his gospel in rebuke to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I think he knows their gospels. And everything he says, from his point of view, says it better. He would have said, oh, Luke 1 and 2, Matthew 1 and 2, that's using our terms. Oh, no, it's, it's not, it's bigger than that. It's the intelligibility of the universe walking around in sandals. Take a good look at J Jesus and you'll understand the universe. Now, that makes sense to me as an evolutionary statement. It really mm -hmm. does. Not just a, a theological statement or something. So I see John as everywhere he goes, he's correcting. So, for example, when you get to the crucifixion in John, Jesus is pretty much running the whole show. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus up on the cross in John, I kind of imagine him, excuse me for this, kind of saying, you know, you can see Mount, Gil you can see Mount Herman from up here. He seems to be having a lovely time. You know, he takes care of, of the beloved disciple, takes care of Mary. Then he looks around when he's good and ready. He says, okay, it's over. I'm out of here. Now, that's not what you get in Mark. <laughs> my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's Mark. That's Mark's vision of the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. John's vision is, no, how do you crucify God? Well, very carefully. <laughs> very, very carefully. <laughs> And then how do you bury God? Well, look at the burial in John. There's hardly room in that tomb when all the, when all the uh, ointments are put in there for the body. John is a kind of a rewrite of the whole story in terms of God walking around in sandals. Mm -hmm. Now, there's truth in that because it's a transcendental vision, but there's danger in it too that becomes unhuman, yeah. uh, irrelevant there for, for us. Yeah. Well, you know, the way you laid that out, it makes me think that line towards the end of the prologue where it says he came to his own and they knew him not. I think yeah. it's the uh, uh, <laughs> the version um, yeah. in the King James. Um, I mean, that makes sense in a sense, like the the uh, principle of reason for existence that in the in the prologue is the source of all love and life and, yeah. and light. Uh, what happens when it takes up a flesh or Honestly, Dom, you you have a number of tweetable phrases. The intelligibility of the universe walking around in sandals. Uh, <laughs> what happens uh, when it when it shows up? Uh, it gets taken down by the powerful. Like it, like the, it's a you can see the uh, family resemblance right between the four gospels, who in different ways you, inheriting traditions differently, liking their own version, but they do share this sense um, that uh, what we see. And what Jesus said, did, and endured uh, is a revelation of the grain of the universe we're called into uh, over against the death-dealing powers of empires and all of their societal, cultural, and religious, uh, you know, uh, partners. And it's it, when he came onto his own. That's us. It would be nice to say, "Well, that mm -hmm. was just that was just a high priest, or that was just Herod." Or no, his own are those of us who should understand the intelligibility of the universe and should ask the sort of questions that we're asking, well, you know, are we a sustainable species? And not because we're evil. That's not, that's not the problem at all. The problem is, that, as we said, if you, if you are a social, social species, 
how can you have individual wills? Just try and imagine all the other great social species. So we said before the termites and the bees and all the rest of them. One little bee stands up one day and says, well, they're all going this way, buzz, buzz, I'm going this way. You know, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've given up on honey. <laughs> I'm fed up with honey. <laughs> and the bee leads a revolt against <laughs> You know, why should we obey the queen? So we are the unique social species that we are. Our glory and our challenge is that we pull towards the individual, and that's great. And we pull towards it. But if we pull apart, then we can't survive as either. You, mm -hmm. you, only do it in a complete osmosis as it were between the individual otherwise as we said there's anarchy at one side and there's tyranny at the other side mm -hmm. okay. we we backwards and forwards like a tennis ball between them and that, that that doesn't work yeah yeah all right well um we, we're out of time but don't worry dear <laughs> partners we were going to have a, a post christmas q a um, if you've already sent the questions, then I have them all chronicled, uh, but you can all respond to any of the class emails to send in questions for next time. Uh, those of you who want to hang out tomorrow night at seven uh, Eastern, Diana and I will be having, uh, we'll be having fun. It'll be fun. We'll probably will be drinking during it if people want to bring their own beverage to the Zoom stream. Uh, but uh, Dom, yeah, I, I want you to know, I always like hanging out with you, but I have to say, uh, if you combine your accent with <laughs> your visual presentations, it's a new it's a new level, new level of excitement. Thank you. And I've, I've you. I'm not the only one who has been uh, uh, deeply uh, enjoying this. So thank you all uh, for being here. And um, I, I, also, there are a few of you that um, I know have messaged separately saying you were uh, using using this in groups in reading groups or Sunday school classes and all that kind of stuff. If there's a particular topic or question in that group, um, I would love to know what it is. So we make sure we mm -hmm. tackle that in the Q and a thing. And then y'all can uh, uh, play. Guess what Don will say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. And we will do the questions. I, I realize we didn't get nearly enough done. But so we, we, we have more, maybe more than one session trip. It's up to you. All right. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say no to hanging out with you on the internet. Uh, so, all righty. We'll see you all again soon on the other side. Have a happy, healthy, holy Christmas. Bye.